Thank you so much, Sarah. Just while you're doing that, I just want to thank the California School Based Health Alliance um, for just bringing us together for this powerful uh, convening. Uh, we're so glad to be here and to be a part of it. And thank you just for the community that we see that's joining us um, to hear our story. Really, this is um, a story. It's been a journey. It's been a path uh, in terms of being able to uh, bring uh, dialectical behavioral therapy, such a powerful intervention and uh, evidence-based promise in practice, but a powerful intervention to communities, to our young people who need it most. And so we're really glad to be here uh, with you today and really appreciate you, Sarah, for supporting us with the slides. And um, if you can actually go to the next slide, please. So I'm here with my colleagues. Um, my name is Santoy Trotter, and I have the deep honor to be the program manager for the School-Based Behavioral Health Program uh, at UCSF Biniac Children's Hospital, Oakland. And uh, I am a Black woman, a queer woman. I was born in New York, uh, raised in Atlanta, Georgia, so raised in the South, and I've lived here in uh, the Bay Area and Oakland for the past 30 years. Uh, honored to be here on unceded Ohlone land and um, glad to be here with all of you uh, to talk about uh, how we are both flawless and fallible uh, in our cultural response of DBT work. And one of the things that really uh, lights me up about the DBT work is really the emphasis on emotional regulation and behavior. Um, and really acknowledging how our environment um, is a part of that, including uh, historical oppression. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about that as we get in, but I want to pass it to uh, my colleagues also to introduce themselves. Good morning. I'm Mariana Sanchez Thompson, and I am a LMFT, a clinical therapist at a Youth Uprising Castle Mount Clinic at, in East Oakland. I am first generation uh, Mexican American, bilingual, uh, Spanish speaking, um, cisgendered woman, um, heterosexual, and I am a mama. I am a sister of nine siblings. Um, so, yeah, and one of the things that um, um, has really grounded me into DBT is being a parent. Um, I think I have used a lot of these skills in with my parenting. Um, and then how do I also kind of mix in that, you know, my cultural background has, has had generational trauma and um, certain ways to rear, you know, children and how do I um, uh, parent in a way that's, um, healing and also, um, you know, a rational mind, reasonable mind, and find that wise mind. So I will pass it to Sarah. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for having us. Um, yes, I am Sarah Schneider, and I am an LCSW. I um, was born in central Massachusetts, grew up there for a while out in the country, um, moved to California, though, when I was about eight years old, and have been here ever since. Feel very dedicated to California in this community of Oakland and have been doing this work for coming up on 18 years and love the community of Oakland, feel very dedicated to um, the schools and the community and just the richness and the um, diversity here and just feel honored to be a part of the school based um, team and excited to be presenting to you guys today. So this, I wanted to share kind of what we're going to do over, we're here with together until noon. Um, and so we're going to share with you who we are as we continue to share with you who we are, where we're from in terms of our school-based health clinics and talk about our DBT journey. Um, we'll give you a little bit of an overview about DBT kind of for those who are kind of coming new to the conversation, um, kind of just some information about it as well as look at kind of what is comprehensive DBT. We are in no way a comprehensive DBT program, but we are making our way there, um, kind of somewhere in this middle road. Um, so we're gonna tell you a little bit about some of the facets of DBT. So consultation, individual therapy. And then we'd also like to share with you two um, examples of our DBT skills groups that we've developed um, over the past years. Uh, so, and then we'll have some time for discussion, Q&A. Um, really wanna 
um, learn from you as well. Uh, we know that you know we are all innovating and creating and bringing great clinical practices to young people and to community. And so hopefully we'll have some time to discussion as well. Next slide, please. We want to acknowledge also um, kind of where where we're coming from. And before I do that, I want to just also honor the people from our team who are also here with us. Um, so this right here, you have Ariana, Sarah, and myself. Um, but I know um, we also have Ebony Ellis, Ashlyn Davis, um, Lisa Wild, other people on our team, Monifa Willis, who have significantly contributed to this work. And so we'll have a little bit more time, hopefully, to hear from them as well. Um, but we are from two school-based health clinics, one in East Oakland, uh, the Youth Uprising Castlemont Health Center that serves Castlemont High School, as well as the East Oakland community, and the Chappelle Hayes uh, McClyman's Health Center at McClyman's High School in West Oakland. Um, McClyman's School-Based Health Center opened in 2005 under the great leadership and vision of Dr. Barbara Staggers. Um, who built the adolescent medicine department at Children's Hospital, um, was strongly, you know, always an advocate for community health and health equity, um, and brought, built this community in partnership, built the clinic in partnership with the community, with families, with students, um, coming together that said, we need and deserve quality health care right here in West Oakland. And similarly, there was a community effort, a community organizing effort that built the Youth Uprising Health Center in East Oakland. And so we have always been embedded, listening to and responsive to the communities that we serve. Our health, next slide, please. And our health clinics are integrated. Um, so here's me with Dr. Celeste Allen, um, and we have medical services, primary care. Um, we're part of our FQHC. And uh, we have two school-based health clinics, one teen clinic, adolescent clinic, and then also primary care clinic. So those are our three clinics under our FQHC. Um, we also uh, integrate it with medical services, confidential reproductive health services, health education, as well as psychiatry um, and medical social work, and kind of all of the services that are provided. So we are one thread of a large um, tapestry of services that are provided to the community. Next slide, please. And so for our school-based health services, just to share for everyone to kind of have a sense of kind of where is this DBT work coming out of, we are primarily funded through EPSCT. Um, we also have some additional foundation funding. Um, we at, at our school-based health center have medical social workers that are dedicated to our uh, medical services, but we also have the opportunity here to also have our school-based EPSCT services embedded in our health center. Um, and so I just want to really acknowledge um, what that makes possible. Uh, it may be different for some other school-based health centers. Um, and inside of that, we offer psychiatry um, and also family therapy, uh, adolescent therapy, individual therapy, and group services. And part of our work with the county was providing group services every year. So, you know, every year we would think about different groups, grief group or a skill group or, um, you know, a trauma and acculturation group. So different ways of thinking about group group services um, and eventually kind of landed on kind of DBT as one core services that we wanted to provide to the community. Next slide, please. So this is a picture, um, I'm kind of like waving to our team members that are in the clinic right now. Um, but this is our McClyman's clinic um, in our front door at Chappelle Hayes. And what we hope to do today is really just tell a story. Um, we hope to uh, share, we're, we're excited to have the opportunity to share this story about bringing dialectical behavioral therapy in a cultural responsive way to the community. Um, and hopefully this will be an offering as you hear some of our lessons learned um, and also some of the things that we've discovered along the way. We do wanna acknowledge as I just started earlier that this has been a labor of love. Um, speaking to Dr. Jones, like yes, there's been a lot of love, a lot of effort, a lot of care, and also a lot of creativity and innovation um, and commitment to making this uh, clinical intervention that can be so effective um, available and accessible to the communities in which we serve. 
And so we first want to acknowledge the young people, the students, our clients that have given us feedback, um, who have said, yeah, we like this, but what about this? Um, who have been engaged, uh, who showed up, you know, in the first groups where maybe there were only two people there, um, or, you know, in the other groups that we're having where it's like, oh, where the attendance is actually going all the way through. Um, but just all of the learning that we've had from our young people and is particularly now, you know, throughout COVID and throughout the pandemic um, with so many different stressors that they are experiencing, the ways that they've continued to show up for their own healing and the healing of their community. We also want to acknowledge that we wouldn't be doing this work without the vision of El Amir and the Alameda County uh, School-Based Behavioral Health um, work and that there was a very large effort and initiative to train mental health providers throughout Alameda County and, and DBT. Um, and we just really want to appreciate that investment um, and those resources to begin to build our skills. Um, you also see here the many different clinicians um, from trainees, uh, staff clinicians who have contributed to this curriculum, to designing it, to developing it, to finding images, videos, uh, creating uh, virtual rooms that you'll get to see. Um, there's so much um, innovation, creativity, work that's gone during a time that has been incredibly difficult and challenging. Um, so just want to acknowledge everyone who's been a part. The three of us are here right now, but we're really representing our amazing uh, team and the work that has happened. Uh, we want to appreciate our champions and people who have shared resources with us and also the people that we've learned from. Um, so uh, Liz Dexter Maza, Hale Gar uh, Garnizada, and also our teachers, Dr. Barbara Krishna Stewart and Natalie Todd, who have worked with us along the way to provide training and consultation. So thank you. So we want to kind of begin with kind of what is DBT anyway? And so we're going to share a video and I actually will share this screen um, by Dr. Esme. Um, and just to give you just a, a quick orientation to what DBT is. So I'm going to take over the share and take a moment, take a breath, feel your feet on the ground. Hi, I'm Dr. Esme Schaller. I'm a clinical psychologist and I direct the DBT program at the Young Adult and Family Center at UCSF. I'm here to answer the question, what the heck is DBT? If you're watching this, someone has told you that you or a family member could benefit from something called DBT. The goal of this video is to explain quickly and simply what people mean when they say DBT, who DBT is designed to help, and what being in DBT treatment might actually look like. The main goal of DBT is to build a life worth living. This means having things that are meaningful and important to you in your life. So this could mean music to one person, horses to another, and a quiet room with lots of books to someone else. DBT is not a suicide prevention program or a way to stop people from doing behaviors that bother others. DBT is to help you. In other words, there is hope if you're suicidal. DBT is one way to overcome these feelings. Let's start with explaining those letters. Acronyms are always a bit confusing. The D stands for dialectical. This is a fancy philosophy word based on the idea of a dialectic, or two things that can seem like opposites, but can in fact both be true at the same time. For example, in DBT, we believe that everyone is doing the best they can, and they need to try harder. We often think of dialectics as a great big scale, tilting back and forth. The main dialectic in DBT is that we are always trying to balance acceptance, you're doing the best you can, this is really how life is right now, with change. You have to try different things to get the life you want. You have to be motivated and work harder. A DBT therapist is thus constantly dancing, trying to make sure they really understand and accept where you're coming from, while also pushing you to change when they can. It can be a complicated step. The B stands for behavior. The behavior is anything that can be reinforced or rewarded. Okay, let me briefly explain reinforcement too. A reinforcer is anything that increases the likelihood that a behavior will occur again. If you study hard and get an A plus on a test, 
the A plus is the reinforcer that increases the chances you will study again. If your dog sits and you give him a treat, the treat is the reinforcer that increases the chance he will sit again. If you do a favor for a friend and he brings you a present to thank you, the present is the reinforcer that increases the chances you will do more favors in the future. The laws of behavior having to do with these reinforcers affect all living things, dogs, dolphins, people, even therapists. DBT recognizes this and tries to harness the power of behavior change to move you closer to your goals, your life worth living. In DBT, therapists work with you to establish target behaviors, things that you are working to increase or often in the beginning, decrease to make your life better. Common initial targets in DBT include thinking of suicide, self-injury, restricting meals, binging and purging, using drugs or alcohol, engaging in risky sexual behavior, reckless driving, physical aggression, and shoplifting. The T stands for therapy, obviously. But DBT is different from other therapies you may have participated in or heard of. DBT therapists have a lot of specialized training in DBT and follow many assumptions and guidelines in their work as DBT therapists that differ from other therapy traditions. All of this is a bit beyond the scope of this video, but I'll let you in on a couple. Our first goal in DBT is making sure you stay alive. This helps us meet our second goal, making sure you stay in therapy until you can meet your goal, which is by far the most important, building a life worth living. DBT therapists believe that the most caring thing a therapist can do is to help push a client toward their long-term goals. Sometimes these goals may seem unattainable. It is a DBT therapist's job to understand how hard it is to change and to simultaneously push you to keep you moving forward. DBT therapists also believe that therapy with someone is a real relationship between equals. That means if you ask your therapist a question about their lives, they'll likely just answer it honestly instead of asking you why you're interested. It also means that the work in therapy is carried out by both of you. It's like a DBT therapist is in a rowboat with you and you are both rowing to get to your destination. Your therapist shouldn't be laying back silently while you row super hard. And you also shouldn't be in the back of the boat drilling little holes in the bottom while your therapist is up front rowing, thinking you're rowing too. It's about both of you working together towards your goals. Now, who can benefit most from DBT? DBT has been studied and is currently being studied for a lot of different clinical populations. What most of them have in common is a difficulty in regulating emotions. This may mean that your life feels a bit like an emotional roller coaster. DBT might work for you if you get more disappointed than it seems like your friends do when plans get canceled or things don't go your way. You cry at movies a lot or even at commercials. You sometimes feel like you were born into the wrong family like you're a lion cub in a family of house cats. If one or more of these things describes you, you might benefit from DBT. Lastly, let's talk about what DBT looks like. Full DBT, the kind that has the most rigorous research backing it up, has four modes of treatment. These are, one, structured individual therapy. There is a focus on behaviors, like we mentioned, and dialectics, that balance of acceptance and change. You'll also be asked to do some tracking of your emotions and behaviors in between sessions. If you're a teen or sometimes a young adult, family therapy will also be included as part of your DBT program. Two, skills group. This is a weekly meeting, usually about two hours long, where you get to learn a different behavioral skill each week to help manage emotions, tolerate distress, and have effective interpersonal relationships. This saves time in your individual therapy to talk about the stuff that's most central to you. If you're a teen or young adult, you'll likely attend this group with a family member or two so they can learn the skills as well. Three, skills coaching. This means you can call your therapist 24 hours a day to get help using your coping skills and to avoid engaging in some of those target behaviors we mentioned earlier. You have a personal coach that can help you change how you react to things at times when it is the hardest to do so. Four, consultation team. This last one may be less obvious to you as the client, but DBT therapists work on a team, a team that helps them support each other and do the best treatment possible. This is essential because changing life-threatening behaviors that have been going on for a long time can be really stressful. If your DBT therapist does not have a team, it's not DBT. Altogether, this takes about three to four hours per week. Another
So hopefully that gives just kind of an overview, just to kind of level set for all of us and to understand a little bit about what DBT is. I think one of the things I want to share for myself, kind of as an adolescent therapist, you know, my roots are actually in creative art therapies, drama therapy, um, kind of really kind of more humanistic, psychoanalyst, analytic, um, kind of where I came from. And I realized kind of working with teens and adolescents um, that the behaviors are, are, are high risk or life threatening. And that I became more of, you know, I actually didn't think of myself as a behavioral therapist um, until kind of taking that DBT intensive initially and really learning that, um, you know, that a lot, and, and also like a lot of the ways that I would work sometimes, you know, when I first kind of knew about DBT, it's like, oh, I'll take this skill and apply it in my treatment plan, um, but not actually using the whole program. So, you know, learning about myself in terms of really actually realizing that I am more of a behavioral therapist than I uh, was aware of kind of initially, um, given the needs of the young people that we work with. And Sarah, you can go ahead and uh, go to the next slide, please. So. We want to uh, talk just briefly about kind of what our journey has been. Um, that's a little bit about kind of my personal journey in terms of moving more into uh, behavioral therapists. Um, and next slide, please. But we want to really acknowledge that this did start with a uh, uh, pour of resources from Alameda County um, and you know provided trainings uh, for mental health providers, school-based providers, other community clinic providers. Um, and then we were able to have actually direct consultation with Liz Maza, who has written many books and has resources around doing DBT with adolescents and also DBT in school. So we have a list of resources later that kind of at the end of the slide or in the handout. So please take a look at those. Um, and then we started trying out DBT groups. And one of the things that was interesting initially when we first um, had our first DBT group is that we got referrals from everywhere, uh, not the schools that we work with. Um, but also like from our hospital system, you know, people were looking for, people who knew what DBT was, were looking for DBT groups. And, and initially that was actually folks with a lot more privilege um, and people who didn't live in the neighborhoods where our school-based health clinics were. So that was, you know, really interesting. Kind of that word got out that we had a DBT group and we had families that came from throughout Oakland, um, but, you know, weren't the communities in which we uh, serve and also um, didn't necessarily look like the communities that we had. So. You know, we did do those groups and we supported them, um, but we also had kind of less, I think there was less cohesion in those groups. Um, and also we were still really just learning, how do we do this? How do we work with the families and parents? Are we doing parent groups and the youth together? A lot of different, as Adiana will talk a little bit later about kind of growing pains in those first groups. Um, and then, um, one of our colleagues who uh, is not here for right now, but I want to acknowledge Maria Masqueta, who was doing groups with recent immigrant groups in our newcomer population and doing acculturation and trauma groups and began to integrate DBT skills and work into those acculturation and trauma groups with newcomer youth and with a lot of you know wonderful success. Um, and so learning from the work that she was doing as she was developing those groups and those were in person. Uh, we began to kind of rebuild kind of and continue to do training with Dr. Natalie Todd and Dr. Barbara Krishner Stewart to think about like how do we apply DBT principles and skills kind of in the in the communities that we're working in um, and began to like develop DBT groups for both clinics. Um, and then COVID happened. So we did a lot of, you know, if anyone who's done group and school-based health clinics did a lot of work to recruit, to orient, to find a space. We were kind of in the choir room and we had to get someone to unlock it, each group and kind of then go find all the young people who had like registered for the group and you know get them into the room and i remember our first group one of sarah's clients you know was kind of the only one there like ready to go and we're like okay well we're gonna do it like with one participant right now we're gonna like do some mindfulness we're gonna do the orientation we're gonna talk about your goals and we had that group with one person and then began to recruit for the next group and then COVID hit and so uh then we had to kind of reshift and think about how are we going to provide these DBT groups, learn how to do telehealth, um, and develop the curriculum in a culture responsive way uh, through telehealth. And now we're kind of back to delivering these groups in person in the school. So you'll, you'll hear about kind of that whole journey, but really want to know for anyone who is already applying DBT groups or in the process to 
you know, honor the journey that you're on. You know, part of the reason our name is Flawless and Fallible is because we made mistakes. We learned along the way. Um, and with DBT, it's like we want to, we, we can be transparent and, and know those. So next slide, please. And you can go to the next slide. Thank you. We've already talked about kind of the three different components of a DPT group. And I'm going to pass it to Ariana to talk a little bit about our outreach and referrals and how we went that way. Right. <clears throat> so um, for so pre-COVID, um, usually when I also did groups and I had the opportunity to do groups with Maria also, um, you know, we got a lot of referrals through the schools um, that we work with, through the cost meetings, the uh, coordination of uh, services team meetings, um, and also through our medical team um, who um, would, you know, would see students for medical reasons in our clinic and then they, you know, would funnel them to us because they knew they were Castlemont students or uh, other uh, schools in, on campus. Um, and so, you know, we would, um, you know, just evaluate, assess and make sure that they uh, fit the criteria. Um, and then once COVID hit, um, it totally changed our, our way that we would assess, that we would kind of engage students. Um, so because now everything was virtually. Um, so instead of getting most of our referrals through like our, our school that we work with and our medical team, we got them like from everywhere in the county. Um, and so, um, so we were, you know, uh, our last team that we felt was a, more of a success uh, virtually, uh, we had 10 solid group members that attended uh, for most of uh, the sessions. Um, and um, and they were from everywhere. So they were, they would identify their schools. Some were um, community college students, some were like Cal State Hayward or Cal State San Francisco. And then some were high school students, like 16, 17 years old. Um, so we were seeing a, a bigger range. Um, and then uh, we also uh, realized that reinforcement was very important once, you know, once we were doing these groups virtually. Um, so usually we had the opportunity to go to the to their classes, pull them out before COVID, you know, show our great personalities, and that would be enough to kind of hook them with like some treats, um, some food in group. Uh, but virtually, they really had no, there was no, really no incentive. Like, why do I have to turn my camera on? Like, why do I have to talk? Uh, so we really had to get creative about how we can, um, you know, show the value of like DBT and this is what's in it for you. Um, and with that, another incentive was self-care packages. Um, so one of our main groups uh, that we first met with um, that was virtually right after COVID hit, um, I, it, was, it, was, it was pretty painful, I'm going to be honest. Um, they turned off their cameras. We were like, you know, chatting with them personally, like, hey, what's going on? Nothing. Can you turn on your camera? So we're like, no. Like, can you like, uh, uh, can you participate verbally at least? No. Um, so then we we kind of came up with like, okay, let's do a stress kit, um, like a kit for them. And so we put in like Play-Doh, um, essential oils. Uh, we put in like an electric candle with the batteries. Um, we put in like those mandala sand, ma the sand mandalas, um, and then and coloring pencils, coloring pages, and like even some like candy in there. Um, so like really like incentivize them to kind of join our sessions and use those stress kits with with us. Uh, so we incorporated that in our curriculum. Um, so that was pretty helpful, and we did see a shift um, with our, our participants. Uh, next slide. So then, um, this is the inclusion criteria. So again, this you know DBT, like the video showed, um, it's more for the the uh, patients that have pretty big emotions. Um, um, you know, are high risk, self harming, suicidal, um, severe anxiety or aggression. Um, and, you know, really, um, and although they may be struggling and they may be, they may be in pain, they want to, they're, they're, there's a, a yearning for change. Um, and the exclusion, um, you know, mm -hmm. no active psychosis. Um, and uh, that was one of our learning pains also with the first virtual group that we had is we had a, a patient that was, um, was in early psychosis, uh, displaying symptoms of early psychosis, and um, was preoccupied, internally preoccupied, distracted. Um, so then that patient was not able to uh, complete group. Um, 
so that you know that is also something just to keep in mind um, and you know learning impairments I think also is important I did have a patient um, with a cognitive delay however this patient was able to kind of take in some information hold it and then in our individual sessions we were able to process um, like some of the, the, the skills that were that were displayed in, in set in group um, so you know it just depends where uh, our patients are uh, developmentally uh, and cognitively um, and then uh, we definitely want to make sure that we do assess for their motivation if they're just like I don't want to turn on my camera or I don't, I'm not going to talk um, then that may be the you know um, DBT may not be something that they're ready for now one of the things that I've learned um, about DBT is that DBT are our patients cannot fail in DBT either it's something that we are doing that we're fallible um, or they just it's just not a good um, model for them right now um, and that is something that we do we do kind of process with them like okay maybe you're not might not be ready maybe let's just stick with talk therapy for now um, or uh, something else um, and then um, so our DBT group is eight weeks and we do you know in an ideal world we do want to have a, a, an individual therapist attached to each individual in therapy and we know that right now especially once COVID hit like mental health is such a needed uh, resource uh, we have wait lists um, and so one of the things that we are doing currently right now with our Spanish speaking um, group is that we our facilitators are meeting every other week with group members to meet with and review the skills and really reinforce the skills so that um, in group sessions they feel comfortable and they can uh, participate and yeah and that will that concludes me next slide We wanted to share briefly about our consultation team and this was another learning because they initially we had our dbt groups and we had a regular case consultation um, but we didn't actually have a focused dbt consultation team um, and that included discussion about the dbt skills the groups how students and clients were responding and integrated the individual therapists and the group therapists together um, so here's just an example of our team. Um, you know, we start with some mindfulness. Um, and I just want to invite everybody right now just to take a moment, feel your feet on the ground, and feel the seat if you're sitting or standing. Notice kind of what's holding you up. And just take three intentional breaths. So notice the air as it comes into your nose. Notice your rib expanding. And as you exhale, Notice the contraction of your ribs or your belly. And just do that two more times at your own pace. So there are many different types of mindfulness, a whole that we rotate in our consultation team. Um, facilitator, so the person who's facilitating leads the mindfulness for that time and also helps set the agenda or sets the agenda and facilitates the meeting. And then we have one person who's observing, right? And then the observer becomes the facilitator the next time and we have a list. Um, we have a time we want to like have people come in with their real selves, right? What are they, do how are they doing? Uh, one of our clinicians, Ebony, um, suggested, you know, let's, you know, one to five, how are we doing? Right, and that we have a brief check in every time so that we can, you know, especially again during these times, so much stress and changes that we can kind of come in and check in with each other. Um, you know, I'm today I'm a three and a half, like I'm happy to be here, right, um, and share things. Um, there are updates from the groups, and then we'll review a therapist agreements that we're going to go into, and then we set the consultation agreement uh, agenda for clients that we're reviewing. Um, we let people know when we're taking time off so that we can um, cover for each other. And then we have some observations for the reflection, you know, the observer to provide any reflections and then we have an appreciation and close. So that's our agenda for our consultation team. Next slide, please. And part of the consultation includes um, the consultation, DBT consultation team agreements. And 
one, uh, I think, again, improvement or lesson learned, we used to read a new agreement each, each consultation each week. Um, and often it was like, let's find the consultation agreements, where are they? Um, but we have, you know, have them and can review them. But one of the things that we started doing was actually to live with one consultation agreement for the month and really, you know, have a chance to check in about it and see how that's influencing, influencing us, our behaviors, how we're doing. And so the consultation agreement we just want to offer to everyone today is the fallibility agreement which is we are all fallible and we make mistakes, right? And to be able to, to observe that, absorb that, right? With compassion and care, um, it creates, you know, one of the cultures that we're trying to create right now is just radical acceptance, radical authenticity. Um, and to be able to have a consultation agreement of that, you know, we are fallible as therapists, we are, you know, even with our best intentions, you know, we're gonna make mistakes. And I think that's also so important in particular when we're talking about race and implicit bias, right? That we need to also have a place where we can surface our mistakes, um, surface, you know, unintentional harm that we might be creating, um, call each other out, um, and with a recognition that we are, we are gonna make those mistakes. So just wanna offer this as a tool. And next slide, please. Um, and then for our cases consultation, we do have um, a way that we, um, prioritize and set those agenda. And so initially, so for DBT, looking at both any high acuity safety concerns and any therapy interfering behavior. So, um, because if they're not, you know, if they're having behaviors that are life threatening or at risk, right, if they're not able to attend treatment or if there are things getting in the way, they're not going to benefit from therapy. So those are the two initial priorities that we address. Um, and I will say, you know, throughout you know, March 2019 to now, um, the amount of safety uh, concerns, suicide risk, uh, self-injury, self-harm, you know, has definitely increased during this time. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that. I'm sure for other clinicians here in this room, you're also experiencing that. And so even though there's a higher need, how do we make sure, and when we think about therapy interfering behaviors, we're thinking about for us as the clinicians, Right. If that young person's not making it, what can we do? How can we improve? Um, one of the things for a consultation team is that we're putting our own names up, right? Not the client's name, but our name. So like if I have a presentation, it's like Santoy, um, and you know, I'm presenting on a challenge that's for me, not the client is not the problem, but I have a problem in terms of maybe supporting that young person to engage in treatment. Again, we also, also important to acknowledge our burnout. Um, so and to share about effective behaviors and introductions. So this is our agenda setting. Next slide, please. And I wanna pass it to my colleague, Sarah, um, to share about kind of the role of the individual therapist in DBT skills. Again, we often hold skills groups, skills groups, skills groups. The individual therapy is a really important role um, and she's done an amazing job kind of holding um, young people in individual therapy who are part of the DBT skills group. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, it has definitely been a journey, um, and I will talk a little bit about the ways in which we are really um, holding the DBT model um, to fidelity and the ways in which we are sort of working towards, or, um, you know, there are some parts of it that we haven't yet been able to fully um, adopt and apply. Um, but, you know, even just as we got started, you know, helping with the recruitment, helping with identifying which clients on your caseload would be appropriate for DBT was a really important role of the individual therapist to be able to recognize, highlight, and introduce this um, modality to the young people and get them connected and um, engaged in the group. And so there was a lot of kind of behind the scenes, preparation, work, descriptions, helping young people to understand what is DBT, why it's going to help be helpful, and why it's applicable to their goals. Um, and definitely during the quarantine, during the pandemic, you know, when we're all on Zoom, I think, you know, the kids had Zoom fatigue just like the rest of us. And sometimes it was like, ah, oh, another group, wait, there's going to be homework. You know, why do I have to show up? Well, I can just go with my camera off like I do in school. It was like, eh, no, this is going to be a little bit different. And, you know, but it is so important and being able to be excited about it, passionate about it and help them understand really why. And they and come up with 
plans to support their successful engagement. You know, how am I going to, as the individual therapist, remind them, help them prepare, help them create a space that is going to be um, amenable and, or support their, you know, turning their camera on or getting dressed and being participant, you know, being active participants. Um, sometimes took a lot of work um, to help them make sure that they were really ready for engagement. Um, you know, we also have to add DBT to our treatment plans as a modality. Um, and so thinking about as a PSDT provider, we have to be very clear about our intervention strategies um, and where this fits in our objectives and goals. And so making sure that it's also a part of the treatment plan and that our current treatment plan also recognizes the needs um, and how DBT is going to effectively meet those. And so I know we've talked a bit about that. So um, go to the next slide, please. Um, and so this sort of outlines some of the skills that we are working on and reinforcing in individual therapy. Um, and some of it was a little bit of a, had, a, had some growing pains as well when you're moving from more traditional talk therapy into a more structured, scaffolded, skills-based therapy. Um, I think sometimes the kids were a little resistant to giving up some of their time to working on the skills. But the more we did it and the more we were able to highlight how these are really concrete, specific things that you can do when you're in a moment of crisis, when you have those, you know, feeling emotionally dysregulated, when you're, um, you know, tempted to engage in an argument with the family or or feeling triggered, you know, this is actually laying out very specific things, steps for you to take, and it really helps you to prepare um, ahead of those moments of crisis and know what to do. There was much more buy-in, and I think the kids got more excited as the um, as they were able to participate in the groups and they had the interactions with their facilitators and then the follow-up and, um, you know. I will say that we have not moved to a model where we are incorporating families in the groups yet. And so as the individual therapist reaching out to families, you know, providing updates, letting them know what the young people were working on, you know, coaching the young people to introduce their, you know, their skills to their families is sort of a middle step that we've been taking as individual therapists. Um, and I will say the coaching calls, the 24 hour coaching calls, we have not quite moved into that. Um, we provide, um, coaching during our regular weekly hours um, and, you know, provide more of the crisis resources um, to support and address needs outside of that. Um, I think we may, I, there's always a lot of questions about, wait, I have to be on call 24 hours a day. Um, and, you know, from our trainers, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback and a lot of, you know, it's not as bad as you think. It's going to be great, but we're definitely still working towards that as a goal. Um, but haven't fully implemented that yet. Um, I think same with diary cards. Some therapists have been begun to use them. Um, some are more, um, I will say for myself, haven't been working with young people to track their behaviors more informally, um, making notes in their phones, you know. And so again, with a lot of these different things, we are working towards um, full implementation. I think the chain analyses have been really helpful. You see the, the bubbles at the top, being able to break down decisions, um, triggers, you know, what exactly happened in this situation? Where can you break that chain? Where can you um, influence uh, shifts in behaviors? How can you make um, different decisions in the moment? And what skills can you, you can use? Um, if you wanna go to the slide, please. Um, one of the there there are so many different activities in dbt um many of them have all acronyms um the give uh, skill is one of my favorites um and something that the kids can use a lot especially as teenagers and in conflict relationships with family um, or caregivers um give stands for gentle interested validate easy manner and really just provides a little bit more of a framework for um, engaging when there is conflict, um, when you're having a disagreement with a family member, how to build stronger relationships. I feel like we use that all the time and kids really respond to that. I think the accepts is also a really helpful tool um, and really breaks down coping strategies into very specific um, and detailed categories of interventions and really helps young people to not just say, oh, well, I'm going to take a walk or I'm going to go, you know, listen to my music. It gives you all these, it gives you seven different specific categories and helps them to create and initiate um, 
a more comprehensive list of things that they can do when they're starting to struggle and feel overwhelmed. And all of these things were things that we were able to really flesh out and expand in individual therapy and then share with their family members and then have them come back and bring it back to their groups and reinforce in that setting. And so the partnership between individual therapy and the skills groups, um, I think has been really important and really helped to expand and deepen the work, the individual work. Next slide. Thank you, Sarah, uh, just for sharing that. And, and, and Ariana, um, one of the things we do want to also hold, because anytime we bring um, an intervention, you know, a, 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 to a community, we know that we have to look at it, right? We have to bring it, we have to think about it and have it actually be responsive to the communities that we serve. And so um, we're gonna share with you kind of two different skills groups. But I think one of the things we want you to take away is that it's not, you know, DBT is not just skills. So that's why we started with sharing about our consultation group and individual therapy work. Um, and the skills are, I think for me working in community for 15, you know, over 20 years, but in 15 years in school-based work, um, I see, you know, with providers and clinicians, how important the relationships are and the therapeutic uh, mental health services. And I always want a young person to walk away. Like we're, we're always temporary in that young person's life. And I think what DBT has provided is like, oh, now I know I can, you know, such a deep trust that they're walking away. Um, you know, what skills that they can have for a lifetime and that they can continue to use, right? And DBT is not for everyone. It's not for every young person or every time, but for those who are um, open to it, motivated, who are engaging in it, we do see a transformation and change happening and something that they can put in their toolbox and walk away with. Um, this image was, uh, it's actually a mural that's kind of right around the corner from the Climans, um, I think in sort of a, like an abandoned gas station. Um, but it's just, it's a beautiful image um, and part of our work, you know, we know that given our communities that there's invalidation, right? We'll talk about um, what creates the deep uh, emotional dysregulation, right? And, and some of our young people in our communities and ourselves and our teachers and staff, right? And one of the things that's an invalidating, invalidating environment. And that's not only what happens in our families, right? It may be that, you know, a slight example is like, you know, when the parent says, oh, you know, I'm cold, you're cold, put a jacket on. And the kid says, oh, I'm not cold. And it's like, yes, you are, put a jacket on, right? Like slight, tiny little invalidation, right? It could be, you know, what are you crying for? I'll give you something to cry for, right? That's something like a commonly heard uh, phrase in the culture that I'm from, right? So. Um, but also, you know, there's the invalidation that can happen in our families between parent and child, but there's also the invalidation, the deep invalidation that happens for communities of color in our country, right? The, the message that, you know, you're not valued, you're not worthy, um, you are not brilliant, um, these messages that come to our children, right? You are not, you know, uh, you know, I think about resources in the communities and the schools, some of the things that we're facing right now, you, you don't deserve to be safe, right? And so that is an invalidating environment, right? Um, and that there are so few also images of, of brilliance, right? And here in Oakland, you know, there's a lot of effort to create those images and we see them everywhere, but we needed to put that in our curriculum. So next slide, please. So this is, and I'm gonna just share maybe about three or four of these and go quickly so you can see both examples. So one of our groups was flawless. Um, and we talked about it initially like a life skills group for black youth. And we decided to actually address kind of some of the most vulnerable ages um, one year as a team. So we decided to do this group for black transitional age youth, 18 to 21, that transition out. And we also did a group for um, people coming into ninth grade and we ended up extending that to 10th graders. Um, as well. So those, and um, you get, and, and this is a team that facilitated. And one thing I want to say about our facilitation team, kind of when we, so not all of our groups were specific populations, but some of them were, and this was a group that was specific for Black youth. Um, and one of the things is, um, but we only had two Black clinicians, myself included, um, and only one who was, had kind of previous training in DBT. So I just want to acknowledge kind of the whole team that came along, right, that supported this work, including trainees um, and, and staff. I mean, we all work together. 
And one of the things that we have said is that, you know, optimally, ideally, we would want, you know, a group that was just a black space. Um, but we didn't have the staffing to do that, you know, at that time. And so we said, we can still hold this group right, with multicultural leaders and just be transparent about that and be transparent about what that means. Um, and so that's what we did. So I want to like encourage people, even if you don't necessarily have the staffing to you know, do some creative thinking together, how do you integrate to hold groups that are predominantly majority, um, you know, an affinity group for one culture to support that space. Next slide, please. Um, and we'll just, you know, did some Zoom orientation. You can kind of continue. Um, next slide, please. And, um, you know, in, in every group, you know, setting agreements um, for confidentiality. This was really interesting, especially during Zoom time, um, but really kind of holding some agreements that we set and then also encouraging young people to set their own agreements. Next slide, please. And we wanted to ask you just for a moment, right, to think for yourself, like kind of if you want to put in the chat, but like what's one thing that you celebrate about your culture? So a lot of our group, especially for the flawless group, was celebrating culture, reinforcing um, cultural pride, identity, examples. Um, and so as you're watching and listening, just if you care to put your name in. Um, and what's one thing that you like and that you're celebrating about your part of your cultural selves? We know as Ken Hardy shares, we have multiple cultural selves. Um, so I see food. Thank you, Emilda. Um, but as ask people to continue to kind of share some things you're celebrating. Next slide, please. We also needed to speak to the context. So this was, you know, one of this group, this group was last summer um, and fall. And to really acknowledge that we were at the, you know, anniversary of George, Mr. George Floyd's death, um, that, you know, the anniversary of Ahmaud Arbery, right? And to really hold, to honor, to take a moment to feel together, to grieve together, um, to acknowledge the impact of these losses collectively um, as Black folks coming together. Um, so I think that's part of what we, you know, one of the things that we were able to do in this group. Next slide, please. And to be explicit about our purpose was around building cultural pride, community, and skills for living. And we were able to do one of our trainees, Teresa Lau, was very tech savvy. You know, I want to credit her for a lot of the artwork in, in the Flawless group. Um, but also she created like mentees and other ways that we could um, engage participation via Zoom. Next slide, please. And I think I'm going to actually ask you to go to the slide that is around that says emotional regulation. Oh, actually, can you go back one more? Sorry. Um, so the group format. Ah, you got it. Keep going. So just for people to see, as, as we shared earlier, that we did do next uh, eight week group, that one. Thank you. Um, you know, a full DBT uh, comprehensive program usually is about six months. Um, and, you know, again, here we are walking the middle path. We are piloting what we can. We were able to develop an eight week group and this is skills group. And so we are choosing to introduce the skills, include mindfulness. Um, and that's what we are um, able to provide kind of in a quality and way. Uh, and hopefully building towards eventually having a full, you know, six month group where people are able to enter into DBT at the mindfulness stage for those who are more familiar. We're also looking at how do we build DBT, and I heard that someone, you know, I think in Washington is doing it or somewhere, but building DBT skills also into the classroom, right? Building it with the teachers. And I think when we're thinking about school-based work, like, yes, we want to, you know, include the families and do um, that work and reach out to the families and um, support the learning, and that can happen kind of more individually, but also we want to have the teachers hold these skills as well and be able to reinforce those in the classrooms. And I'm going to have you um, go actually just, I'm going to pass it to you, Ariana, because I want to um, folks to hear about your group and I'm noticing the time. So just to be transparent. So Sarah, if you can go to DBT and kind of just click slowly through these slides so people can see, right? This is a biosocial theory that's explained um, and which is, you know, core tenant of DBT. You can keep going. And you can go to the next slide and to the next. So um, invite people as we transition now, 
to my colleague, Ariana Sanchez, who has done amazing work and has been a part of this journey throughout, was one of the few people who were at the training five years ago that the county created um, that's still here with us on our team um, and has been thinking about developing and implementing DBT, you know, both with newcomer youth, with our full population, um, and has really led this uh, DBT in Espanol work um, because folks, there aren't that many resources for, uh, so I'll let you speak about it, Ariana. So passing it to you. Anna. Thank you, Santoy. Yeah, so DBT in Espanol. Um, so even the DBT is uh, it's TL TLP, right? Uh, terapia Dialectica de Trastorno de Personalidades, for those that speak Spanish. Um, so it, it, it took some challenges, you know, doing some research, trying to find uh, material that would translate to our uh, patients that speak uh, Spanish from Mexico and Central America. Uh, and just kind of um, holding like what words and dialects, like the difference between Argentinian Spanish and Spain Spanish, and so Mexican Spanish and Central American Spanish. Um, and then also holding the fact that a lot of our patients um, who come from Central America, um, Spanish is the second language. So just really holding that and being careful about the wording that we put in our slides, um, being careful how, or being thoughtful about how uh, each word would land. On them and I'll provide some examples. Next slide. So our name for our group is de la Claridad, um, and so uh, it's a you know a group for uh, uh, to create a, a life worth living, like Marsha Linehan says. However, when we try, we were trying to translate even the name um, or the or the the saying of creating a life worth living. We had some issues with that because the way it translates um, is tener una vida que vale la pena vivir. And so we're like, la pena, you know? So it feels like it kind of maybe even just like minimize or just like, it wasn't as as dignifying. Um, so that is what we put um, una vida digna uh, de vivir. So, um, so yeah, so that was like just the process uh, that uh, we were experiencing and that took and it took a while uh, to to translate uh, a lot of material. Next slide, please. Um, so we, you know, we start uh, one of our, our exercises usually with a mindfulness exercise. Um, I did um, for our uh, attendance one of the the incentives that I said we could provide a gift card. Um, and at the beginning, we were providing a gift card at the end of each group, but then when we when we went um, telehealth, telehealth virtually. We were seeing that you know what some of our patients weren't sticking so then we provided um the gift card in the middle so after four sessions we would provide twenty dollars and then at the end we would provide the rest of the twenty dollars so there was always room to to get a gift card even if you miss the first one or two uh, the last four you could at least get another gift card and that was a, a point where we can really reinforce like listen I, we know you're doing your best and you need to try harder um, and you know you need to do better, um, and so um, that is something that you know uh, we we kind of tend to hold on to and how to use the reinforcers. Next slide. Um, and so we always strive to you know find um, wise minds. So in Spanish, it's necesaria. Um, and um, one of the examples that you know that I just used this week for our, our Spanish speaking group is that you know i was flustered i had to go to uh to go get uh, snacks for um for group i had to go drop off my kids who want to take her want to preschool and so then i had to get to like you know the school and you know get group ready and so that is my opportunity to show how also uh, i am flawless and fallible um and i let them know like hey like when i got here when i got out the car i was feeling pretty anxious um and you know what i had i realized that I had to really take note of what was happening for me and I had to really take like five deep breaths. And while I was doing that, I, you know, in MacArthur, so we're on MacArthur in Oakland. And so MacArthur is a very busy street. There's a lot going on, but I really was working hard to listen past the cars and kind of like the noise. And I was able to listen to the birds sing. Um, and that really helped me ground myself. So always showing examples of like, what our experiences, like our personal experiences, but not 
to mm -hmm. where it's too personal or too dysregulating for us also as facilitators. And uh, next slide. And the beauty of you know being a Spanish speaker is that novelas, Spanish soap operas are always opportunities and examples to show dysregulation um, and talk about how we can use our skills. So that is something that our patients are truly enjoy and we could talk about. Um, but also we just you know reinforce like pain is part of life um, and we can't avoid it. Um, how do we manage pain and um, so that we don't we don't respond in an impulsive way and um, and so that we don't hurt ourselves or others um, when we're in you know those stressful moments. Next slide. And so I'm not sure if Marsha Lenahan would accept this, but um, when I was uh, uh, translating the curriculum, you know there are a lot of acronyms. Um, and so one of them is the wise mind accepts skills. And so our, the only thing that I can think of was what uh, mente sabia pesca, wise man, wise mind fishes. Um, and so we were able to um, link that to the saying of like, if uh, you can teach, you can give a, a person a fish and they can eat for the day, but if you teach the person to fish, then they can eat for a lifetime. And we discussed about, we linked it how we can, uh, that's also the same for our emotional regulation. You may want to rely on others to make things better for you, but if you learn how to manage your own emotions and develop the skills, then you will develop a life worth living. Um, next slide. And um, usually what we have, so when we provide the stress kits, they take that at the end um, of the group, they will take it home. But when we were doing them virtually, uh, we actually mailed it to them or we would drop them off if they were close. Um, but we had like someone that was a community college student uh, and lived in like Tracy. So we had to mail the, um, the stress kit. And then we also had them put in things um, in the stress kit that they already have at home that they may use and might not be aware of that uh, includes the five senses. Um, sorry, I know we're running out of time. Next slide. And we, thanks to Ebony Ellis, uh, one of my coworkers, um, we created a virtual room, a virtual mindfulness room, um, a virtual distress tolerance room. And so um, with these virtual rooms, uh, we add links. Um, and so you may see like the yoga mats or the bowl, the ringing bowl. And so those, if you click on those, um, they actually take you to YouTube videos and, um, and show you like the exercises or ways, or we talk about ways that you can use those links to reinforce the skills outside of therapy and they have access to those virtual rooms. And, and yep, we finished with muscle relaxation and okay. <laughs> Sorry. So again, so we're, we're just kind of in a transition and um, invite folks like kind of one of the you know in terms of mindfulness skills uh for dbt is kind of like full you know you do it mindfully uh pay attention right and then like full participation right and so i'm just gonna invite everyone just to take a moment um you know take a mindfulness moment and fully just like shake out anything that needs to be shaked out right now right kind of we're sitting we're listening just shake out, see if you can like participate as much as you can in terms of your own <laughs> input, right? All right. All right. And so just observe and then notice, right? DBT would say, notice. Notice if you feel energy running through your body, notice your sensations, notice your breath. So thank you for fully participating here and being engaged in that mindfulness exercise. Um, and right now we wanna just take time to see, we, you know, we all just, if there are any questions that would be helpful for us to answer, please go ahead and put any questions or comments in the chat. I don't know if people can unmute um, themselves. Um, we can, we'll do the last few, as people are thinking about questions, um, we'll do the last few slides and then we'll kind of turn off the PowerPoint. So one of the ways we also supported cultural pride, um, tried to create a validating environment um, is by having shout outs at the end of each session um, for the Flawless group. And shout outs of um, Black uh, people who were community leaders, some celebrities, um, 
And also people who like Tara J. P. Henson, who's been great advocates for mental health and been really transparent about their own mental health and well-being are also advocates around seeking mental health or wellness, right? Thinking about wellness kind of in a broader way. And so um, again, shout out to Ebony Ellis for creating a lot of these images um, for that group. Um, I see some questions. Great, so um, if you can kind of just go through Cynthia Revo, the shout outs, and then I'm gonna start to answer some of the questions. So um, is it possible to consult with, let me go to the first questions. What sort of buy-in engagement with school partners did you have to set up the DBT approach group? So that's a great question. So we um, we had to do a lot of also like introducing to our school administrators, like this is what DBT, um, I think I actually, gave one of our administrators one of the books, DBT in Schools. I, um, there's definitely some great resources in terms of introducing it. Um, and also holding, you know, helping them understand, because when we're like, oh, this is something that's going to support young people with, you know, behaviors and emotional dysregulation, they're like, yes, you know, like, what is it? I think one of the things is that then the first group actually, who got referred was kind of all of the high uh folks who kind of high high just dis, emotional dysregulation um kind of most acute kind of girls kind of got referred to the first group right and so it's like okay so how do we like make sure we're doing some conversation and prep and uh really having those initial orientation and commitment sessions like great you know for all of those young people to be in the group and let's actually have those commitment orientations so they're aware of what they're agreeing to um, and able to for themselves identify their own motivation to be a part of that group right so that was one of the things um, and we have also gotten buy-in to teach these skills to teachers it's more around kind of figuring out the time and ways to integrate that and kind of figuring out our own capacity around that but i do think like i i have a vision of like okay take an emotional wise minds except like the whole school practicing one skill for one week right like and you know what would that be like right really holding the school as one of the core relationships that the students in um, Santa, can i add a little something mm -hmm, to that please. um and i also just want to highlight the really important work that the clinicians who come came before myself and i know santo you've been there for so long and i think the, the health centers have done so much work to create a partnership and a collaborative with the school and you know really introducing and solidifying the offering of mental health services in the school setting that that really laid a foundation and a groundwork for inviting and introducing you know a new opportunity i think there was also a really important there was a lot of recognition when the pandemic started that there are a lot of kids who are struggling with self-harm with um, suicidal ideation um, and a lot of worry about young people who are struggling in the isolation and the depression of the um, pandemic. And by offering a DBT group, we were able to serve more young people at one time. And, and that was a really powerful tool and on an offering that we could give to the school community who was really worried about a lot of the young people. Thank you so much, Sarah, for, for adding that context. Um, I'm expecting people to talk back to us is what I'm wanting right now. So I see Jordan, I see your question too around, okay, DBT is that not just for borderline personality disorder, right? And so um, really holding DBT um, was originally developed to treat uh, people with border, what we call borderline personality disorder, which some of us, some you, there is discussion in the field about borderline personality disorder really being a trauma disorder, right? Or, or uh, symptoms related to trauma. Um, and so, DBT is used for anxiety, for depression, for trauma, for other um, diagnoses more than just B BPD. Um, but I also want to go back to the part about like, if we think about intense emotional dysregulation um, being an impact of trauma and then hold who are the young people that many of us are serving in school-based health clinics who are experiencing both individual and community and historical trauma and really holding that as the environment, right? As well as, you know, with the biosocial model, right? Kind of we're all born with different levels of sensitivity and vulnerability and reactivity and ability to kind of come back to baseline, right? But that makes kind of DBT such a great modality 
for our communities. And that's, and in particular for adolescents who have been exposed to trauma, both racial trauma and individual and family trauma. That's what we're learning kind of in our work in terms of how they're receiving it. So thank you, Jordan, for that question. Yes, multiple facilitators. Thank you, Buffy. Yes, two facilitators, at least two facilitators. And, you know, I think, you know, depending on how you're funded and how you're working, we figured out different ways. We're happy people ask, you know, we're happy we have our contact information here to answer questions um, and also to guide you. We're not consultants or trainers. You know, we have been trained and we're, we're, we're learning. Um, but we will happy to share our journey and also to direct you to people who are trainers and certified trainers in DBT. Um, so that I just want to share that. But um, I would definitely say having at least two facilitators and we were able to figure that out with EPCT. You can figure out other ways. But in particular, like you want, you know, to be able to go back and forth, but also to have someone um, who's able to attend to young people individually, whether you're doing it in Zoom or in person, because you can have a breakout room. Let's say if you have someone who is off camera during the group and you're wondering what's going on, you can put them in a breakout room with the other facilitator. And I know that folks did that, right? To so just have a check in, how are you? What do you need? What's going on? You know, and then bring them back. Um, and I think our different groups were, you know, did different things in terms of that requirement too. But yes, definitely two facilitators. Oh yeah, Ariana, thank you for answering that question. And, um, there's a question about kind of working with youth who are on the spectrum or with maybe different developmental delays. Um, and I think we um, had to then kind of think about, will this young, what the skills that we have and what we're offering in the structure that we have with a young person be able to benefit from the group? I think that was the question, benefit from the group process. If not, then maybe being able to hold it in, in an individual therapy. Um, and I think there's, I'm just a proponent, like how do we keep scaffolding kind of the work that we're doing so that you know we're as inclusive as possible. Um, but those are some of the things like in terms of how do we meet folks with different um, uh, who might. But I think, Ariana, you spoke to. Um, I've, I've, I've I mean, I think there, yeah. that one of my patients that took part of the virtual group, um, male, um, enjoyed the group. And actually, with the mindfulness, we were able to use like role play, like, um, um, so how to like visual cues, like social interactions. Um, and that was very helpful for um, my patient, which is part of the group, mm -hmm. who is also on the spectrum. On the spectrum, yes. Yeah. So we're at time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ariana. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everyone. Ashlyn, Ebony, um, Lisa, Kenya, you know, all the people who are not, who are presenting, but also the people who helped develop this work, Manipa Willis. Um, we, Megan Young, um, just so grateful, Shelly, uh, for all the collaboration. Thank you, everyone here with your questions and your attention. Um, we look forward, hopefully next year in person, to be with you. But please contact us. Please share with us. Um, you know, we're, we're definitely want to, we're part of a greater community with you to learn together to bring these services to, to young people and to, to students. So glad. I'll pass it to Sarah, our moderator. <laughs>